In the heart of the One Dish with One Spoon Treaty Territory, Niagara's Sean Vanderclis and Carl Dockstader dish on any and all issues from a First Nations perspective. From pipeline politics to poverty to pan-Indianism and more, Sean shares his concrete curve leg take and Carl gives an urban Oneida angle. You are listening to One Dish, One Mic on the Niagara Podcasters Network. Hey Sean, have you ever have you ever gotten an extended period of time without the internet? Not since I was born. What what's like not at all? Like you've never what's the longest you've gone without the internet? Like you have kids and stuff, so when you go out with them, I'm sure you're not no. always on your phone. No, always. We're are always the, I always have my phone in my Are hand. you Facebook dad? I am. Oh okay. I am. I am. I'm uh the uh <laughs> I'm addicted. I am. That's what I am. I have always have my phone in my hand. I always have a computer somewhere, iPod somewhere, iPad somewhere. It's it's bad. Okay. Could you could you imagine like could you imagine a day without the internet? A weekend without no, the internet? No, definitely not. I wake up at night and check my phone just because. You're that guy too. Yeah. Eh? Okay. All right. Wow. Well, imagine imagine a weekend with no internet. Okay. Imagine a weekend with no television. No, okay. No, that I can do. No books. Okay. No people. Okay. No windows, a fluorescent light that's always on, and you only you're in a single room, and you only get to leave that room for one hour to go for a little walk and to stretch your legs, and that's your only contact with other people. Can can you imagine that? Uh, most definitely not. I thought this was supposed to be a fun episode. What are you just describing? <laughs> this, this isn't. This isn't. This this part of the episode is is not fun. Imagine imagine doing that for 15 days. You know, if you were in a room for 22 hours a day right. for 15 straight days that the united nations would would actually consider that to be to be cruel and right. unusual forms of punishment and actually torture okay imagine going 1560 days for 23 hours a day in a room where the lights are always on that's, all the time that's crazy it's, are you are you talking about uh, mr adam cape i am talking about adam cape who was arrested for uh a bunch of charges and and not not insignificant i'm sure i mean he did enough things okay. that, that caused him to to be brought into the correction system in, in right. thunder bay and then he got into a bit of a prison fight right 1560 days later somebody realizes that he's been in segregated isolation for that mm-hmm. entire time and it's it it can it must be hell for yeah him. it must can, be total hell i i cannot imagine um, being in a situation where the lights are constantly on, right? Where you're constantly having to have this artificial light pretty much pumped into your room without any human contact or access to to the outside world, essentially. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of things that I'm that I'm afraid of. Apparently, you're afraid of not having the internet for <laughs> for a couple minutes. Like, I mean, we've been but. taping for two minutes. I've looked at my phone three times. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, the, that's. I guess. I guess we're fortunate to to be here, you know, yeah. to be to be on the outside uh, yeah. as it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, of all of all the things, if if you ask me, uh, there's there's a bunch of things that that I think naturally everybody's mortally afraid of, right? But I think I think one of those things would would be going to prison right. for sure, and I think that one of those things will be going to. Uh, not just the loss of contact with friends and right. family, but just the whole thought of, of being on the inside of something that, that I think is, is terrifying for, for a lot of people. Right. What's even more terrifying is that is that it's more likely that you or I would be picked up. It's more likely that, that we'll be put on the inside than, than somebody right. who's not indigenous. It's, it's more likely that we could do something minor that if, if we, if we smoke a joint, Depending on what month it is, I don't know how fast these new Trudeau laws are gonna are right. gonna come through, right? But we could be picked up for for minor drug offenses, and then something could happen. And next thing you know, could we spend fifteen hundred plus days in isolation? No, definitely not. But you wouldn't have a choice, right? Right. Like it's it's not like he wanted to spend that time that time in isolation. Right. And I guess to kind of summarize his case, like you were saying earlier, it wasn't as if. He he committed a major crime. He committed a crime, right? Yep. Like you said, he was in jail for a reason, but it was nothing that substantial. Um, afterwards, while being in prison, he got into a fight. He got into a disagreement and ended up with somebody being killed at the end of it. Yeah. Correct? 
Cor- yeah, I didn't, and, and, and I don't want to. No, and I, I guess I mean I guess we should lay some of the some of the facts out. That Adam Adam Cafe was the oldest of six children from a remote northern reservation, and yeah. and, and I don't have you ever been to any of the reservations outside of outside of like like you've been to obviously your own reservation right. and Six Nations, but have you ever been to any of the remote northern reservations? Uh, when I was younger, I had the opportunity to go into a flying reservation. Um, Unfortunately, though, we didn't have the privilege of flying in. We had to canoe in. But, uh, wow. but yeah, uh, I have. And it, it, it's a different world. I mean, to say all reserves are built the same is, is not the truth. Um, I think the further north you get, the more drastic the changes are. Um, but yeah, 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 Oneida is no walk in the park, right? Like yeah. that's that's my home reservation, and, right? And uh, first off, there's great people doing great things, right? And I'm I'm really really proud to know a bunch of them that are mm-hmm. that are doing some really awesome stuff. But but obviously, it's no secret that there's still there's still a lot of social issues that right. that affect Oneida. But from what I understand, and and honestly, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I haven't been to to any northern reservations. Okay. I've through through the Friendship Center movement, yeah. I've met people from reserves north of Kenora and had yeah. conversations with them, and, and talked to people out by like Red Lake and and a bunch of the more remote parts and Cochrane and and some of the more uh, the less sparsely populated parts right. of Ontario, and talked to some of them about the reservations that that they come from, and I don't, I mean. Where is their economic opportunity? Where is there an organic economy? Where is there? I mean, some of them don't even have. I need you to brace yourself for yeah. this, Sean. But some of them don't even have the internet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stop lying to me. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. So, but I mean, honestly, that's that's not even that's not even the beginning of the worst of their problems. So, right. getting back to Adam Cape, he's he's one of six. He's the oldest of six children, and right. that's it. He he has his run-ins, and again, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna paint the picture of, of Adam Cape as some kind of saint. Right? right. He did he did a sequence of things, and even though justice is not blind when it comes to Indigenous people, and even though Indigenous people are more likely to get picked up, to get questions, right. to put into corrections, to serve longer sentences in, mm. in, in corrections, and all the things that are that are well documented by by academics, even though all those things still apply, I'm not I'm not going to excuse the things that that led Adam Cape to be right. in that prison. I'm not going to excuse the fact that it was another indigenous man that he had a tussle with right and it it's from what i understand it had been one of those one of those hyped up days when when you read the story by uh, by scott gilmore yeah they they got to the point where they hyped him up and they had talked him into eating a cockroach earlier mm-hmm. that day and it's just i mean I've, I've talked to some of my friends that uh that were that have been in that environment and and it's it's a different alternate reality so he's living here in this alternate reality and unfortunately he he has an altercation with with another man another indigenous man right and they had a disagreement and it i mean the facts seem to be that several witnesses say that that he climbed on top of this guy and they were in the midst of the fight and that he had he had some sort of sharp object that he right. used to to puncture this poor man's neck mm-hmm. and that he eventually bled out through his neck as as a result of it so again i i mean i really don't want to minimize what happened i mean a man a man did get killed right and there is a high probability that adam cape did it but again i i my understanding is that the justice system is supposed to work that you're innocent until right. proven guilty right and, and we have rules and laws that are in place to prevent the type of atrocities that have happened to him. So even even if there's video evidence with numerous whip, uh, witnesses and there, he's found with weapon in hand, he is still protect. He's still a protected man. He still should be afforded the same amount of rights as as anybody else, as the average person, right? Um, and that's simply not the case for him. So after, I guess to kind of finish your story, afterwards he was put in segregation, which is standard practice. That's apparently the policy is if if you get into a prison fight and someone dies, yeah. and you are suspected of being the person that killed the other person, it, apparently it's it's protocol that this this is what happens. Right. So if you and I were on the inside and, yeah. and I killed you because you know I'm. Uh, uh, then yeah, I'd, I'd be put into isolation right. because there's there's nothing else to do, and and that's the thing though is you'd be put into isolation, which I mean, 
Segregation and isolation are two things that I, I completely disagree with. Um, that being said, it is protocol. It is a standard procedure, but for a limited of time, right? It's, I think, 15 days. Well, 15 days is the standard that the United Nations came up okay. with when Nelson Mandela was a political prisoner. He, he was put into isolation, and right. they decided after reviewing that that, right. that 15 days, after 15 days, it effectively becomes torture. Right. But So I, th- I was reading somewhere that I thought maybe it was two weeks that they are legally allowed to put them in there for two weeks, and any situation that warrants longer, they need special approval to do so. And that never happened in his case. So essentially, what I'm, what I've gathered from all the research that I could find and all of the um, Google searches that I've conducted, is that he was put in there and essentially forgot about. That's what it looks like. It looks like it was an administrative oversight. Yeah. It, it looks like again that, like everything else, it always comes down to money. Yeah. And that perhaps this place was under resourced, mm-hmm. and perhaps this place was was not under any sort of administrative. There the proper levels of administrative oversight. Mm-hmm. And a human being, regardless of, of whether he's a criminal or not, regardless of whether he's a murderer or not, a human being got put into a room. They locked him up. They threw away the key. Yeah. And from an administrative perspective, they essentially forgot about it. Yep. The would this have happened if if he wasn't indigenous? You know, I have to ask. Do you think that do you think that a non indigenous person? You know, maybe maybe Adam Cape doesn't have people advocating for him. Right. Maybe he doesn't have people that can that can come and check as often. Maybe right. that these are the types of things. But do you think that do you think that that would have happened with a non indigenous person? Maybe it does. Maybe I it happens all the time. I think that's I the know. alarming part here, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I think we would have heard about it if it did. Yeah. If it does. Um, I think it's something that would have been all over social media. I mean, I, I remember this article when this happened. So, like, I guess to put a timeline timeline into effect is he was essentially found by a guard. Um, sorry, a guard was aware that he was in there. And that guard kind of told on the jail to a, a higher up gover- government official and that's how the story became public attention and this is going back to last wow. Wow. October right so Unbelievable. it's been like four or five months since that uh, that this story first broke um, but yeah I, I'd like to say that if, if it was a non-indigenous person that it would have been spotted all over the news yeah, it makes you wonder, though, again, it, it he is Indigenous. There's yeah. been a lot of attention that's been shined on Indigenous issues. Yeah. This broke in, in October, yeah. and then in, in November, Scott Gilmore wrote the article that, that our friend Mitch Baird shared with us initially. That's right. that's how I found out about this story, too, was that our friend, our friend Mitch shared this article with us, yeah. and I read it, and I, I honestly, Sean, I have a high threshold for Mm -hmm. the injustice towards indigenous people it's unfortunately i just have this tolerance where it's like yeah an indigenous woman or even worse a young a young indigenous child Mm -hmm. tween maybe teenager got murdered is missing has disappeared and unfortunately that's just become a fact of my life that's that's just things that happen and it's okay and i'm not saying that it's right but but i'm numb to it uh, there, there are a number of other things that happen. Any, anytime somebody I know gets gets picked up or goes back inside or yeah. has any sort of a run-in with the law, again, I, I think to myself that that's that's just the nature of, of life. And as bad as it sounds, it's it's expected. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, working, I'll, I'll wear a suit and I'll wear a tie. I completely blend it with society. But come Saturday, come Sunday, I'll put on a hoodie with a baseball cap, much like I'm wearing today, and I get double looked everywhere I go. Yeah. Every single place I go, people kind of have this, they have to take a look back to see if I'm doing something bad, if I'm doing something inappropriate. Um, like Trayvon Martin, exactly. right? He got shot for wearing a hoodie. Exactly. I mean, it's the same thing. I, we're both wearing hoodies today. Yeah. Does that mean that, that we're going to get picked up after we do this podcast, right? I mean... In all likelihood, just because of the way we look, you know, that's, that's probably ridiculous. not. But I mean, I think we there's a greater risk of us being stopped. Yeah, greater risk of us being questioned, um, and it's a factor that we that, like you said, that has become desensitized and is almost a way of life for us now. Yeah. Um, 
that's why it's it's hard for me to be surprised. Like it's it's really difficult for me to read something in the paper right. and not go, geez, you know, I saw this coming. And, right. and you know, I try to be informed and follow it all, mm. but but it's still like, yeah, you know, par for the course, right? Yeah. But but one thousand five hundred and sixty days, man, like that's that's insane. But it, that's that's. <laughs> I'm at a loss for words. No, it, it is insane. And it, it, when it comes down to it, it is torture, too. What caught me off guard, too, is Kathleen was Kathleen Wynne, the Premier of Ontario, was giving a speech to this, and she was hesitant to follow the United Nations definition of torture. She was uh, hesitant to concede that 15 days constitutes torture. And to me, that's irrelevant, because even if it's not 15 days, let's say it's a month, so 30 days, this, he was in there for over 1,500 days. Yeah. Right? So we're arguing semantics here. Like, if it was 30 days, let's say two months, 60 days. Again, he was in jail for 1,500 days. And she can't grasp that concept that that is torture? Yeah, years right? years and years. Like, it's... Yeah. It's, it is. It's a political failure on yeah. all levels. Yeah. It, it, and this is Canada, too. Like, we're talking about yeah. Ontario, one of the wealthiest provinces in Canada... Right, and one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Is it? Is it though? I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't act like it, right? Because if if you look at the sort of fundamental change in in the justice system, yeah, there. I I always thought that justice was about rehabilitating people, but that's well, I mean, that's that, always the great debate of the that's justice the system. Debate. Is exactly. It, is it rehabilitation or is it retribution? Yeah. Right. When in Adam Cape's case, this seems like a simple case of retribution. Yeah. You you did something that is that is not allowed. Yeah. So we're going to punish you yeah is that that doesn't sound like a society that's that's advanced like a society that's wealthy the, the society that's that's well off so i guess i guess that's the question is when when do ontarians and when do canadians get have to stop calling themselves an advanced society in this group of well-off people because they're the social principles again of locking a man up for 1500 days and throwing away the keys are not reflective of an advanced social society right yeah i mean Definitely not. I I don't know. I I don't know. I don't even know what the answer is. I mean, like the United Nations. I mean, I, maybe I, I like we said last week. I've I've drank in the Kool Aid. I I've bought into the dream, but everything like the reality that we live in is it's not an advanced society. Like our reality versus the average Canadian's reality is a completely different, completely different. I, and again, we touched on this on, on, on another podcast, but the United Nations Human Rights Index clearly states and indicates that if you are a First Nations person living on reserve in the country of Canada, you are not faced with the same issues or benefits that the, an average Canadian is faced with. And I don't know, with Adam, 1,500 days, locked up, lights on. Yeah, this is a clear black and white. I mean, what what you just referred to, I think I think some people call the six sixty seven rule, yeah. the, the, and the basically the Canadians are Canadians are the are would have the sixth highest quality of life yeah. of all all people in the world. And First yeah. Nations people would have sixty seven. Yeah. So we're there with Sri Lanka. Yeah. We're there with Venezuela. We're there with a bunch uh, with Panama, mm -hmm. with El Salvador, right. with with a bunch of countries that that don't have any of the social benefits that's that's where indigenous people are but we're living we're living amongst canadians yeah and in the case of adam cape like thunder bay is is one of the most populous cities in that in that whole region so he's surrounded by people and again nobody's aware that that he's in a room isolated and, and how the story broke too it's like this prison guard kind of had to hide away to tell his friends that this kid's locked up right like, there was no formal attempts being made. It's like he was embarrassed to do so when his prison guard came forward, right? He pulled a, pulled away uh, mommy and daddy and said, hey, there's somebody locked up. Yeah, that's that's the scary part. And I guess that's the thing is that w with the way, with the secrecy with which this has been, been addressed yeah. and without the transparency on the part of the corrections administrative system yeah. or from the Ministry of Justice or, or from the Premier's office, yeah. the question I have to ask is how many Adam Capes are out there right now? Like, exactly. What, what are the I mean, I, I have a temper, right? Yeah. Like, what, what if I got picked up for something? And then what if 
you, it changes you that once you're in there yep. again it's 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 a totally different it becomes a totally different culture once once you're inside of a the what's supposed to be a correctional yeah. institute but what actually is a retribution system right it's yep. it's you have to fend for yourself there's never enough funds there's never enough resources there there's never enough anything and you have to try to get by so so what's what's to say that one of us couldn't get picked up again right one thing escalates and you have to do what you have to do right. when you're in that environment and, and again i don't i don't want to i don't want to minimize what, what happened to i believe it's sherman quissis right who who is also an indigenous man I, I really don't i mean i really feel for his son who i believe is is uh his son is now a teenager right. i believe that his son just turned 18 and and i mean i i really i really believe that that family should have the opportunity to mourn and that justice should have acted and resolved the situation to give that family some some sense of closure. But at the end of the day, I still have to ask myself, what what are the odds that myself or one of my friends or another member of our indigenous community could end up exactly in Adam Cape's situation with the secrecy from the government? I think those odds must be pretty good. I'm thinking so, too. I mean, what, what, what indigenous people have that isn't going from them is, is that shyness and that humbleness, right? A lot of t- a lot of times, indigenous people are right. It's within our teachings to be humble people, right? We're not supposed to be boisterous. We're not supposed to be um, outspoken, right? So being put in that situation where strength within numbers, where whoever makes the loudest noise has the greatest chance of success, you could under you can almost understand why why he was put in that situation, right? Like if you can't talk, you have to fight. Yeah, and again, not to say again, I, I completely, amp- I can't even say that I empathize because I, I couldn't tell you what it's like to to lose somebody in that manner. Um. Yeah, no, it's it, it's again, it's important not to minimize what ha- what happened to Sherman yeah. to Sherman Quisses. So that that is is definitely of paramount importance here, but but it's still it's still. I don't see a lot of distance between what happened to Adam Cape and what happens to a lot of my friends. Again, I, I work I work at a friendship center and mm-hmm. I'm not I mean I'm not going to single anybody out. But when when you grow up poor and when you grow up possibly from a broken home and when you grow up with with a lack of resources and and nobody to to model your life after right and this canadian dream that just doesn't look anything like you or your family or anybody you've known or or anything you value and next thing you know you you make a couple of mistakes those mistakes compound and then you you find yourself in a situation where you have to fend for yourself right and you do what you have to do in that situation and again i'm not trying to i'm not trying to paint some caricature from from tv or from movies or anything like that but but i can i can only imagine and again from from having talked to guys you have to do it, it's sometimes it's just kill or be killed yeah and that's what i was trying to get to earlier is is that's it if, if i don't kill i'm going to be killed and again with all due respect to the family to the victims involved that's the situation and in this case the government has failed has he had his time in court yet i mean four years later he's been charged with a crime are, as a Canadian, are we not guaranteed the right to an ex, uh, meeting with a judge at the earliest convenience? And you can't tell me that there hasn't been opportunities that have arisen within the last four years where he, he couldn't have his time and day in front of a judge. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's some great articles that, that outline what what the hiccups were in in the whole process here. But that is ultimately in in the eyes of the law, one of the fundamental tenets of the law is that that he's accused of committing a crime right now and that in the same way that that family has does have some right to have some closure adam cape also has a right to due process right and and i feel like the longer this is dragged out the worse off the family is for it and even though there have been hiccups that have been like you said have been outlined i mean i feel like that's always the case yeah i mean uh, one of the things that happened in this not this community but around here a couple of years ago was the the case of tim bosma Right, and think of how fast that turned around. Yeah, right. That that literally happened what three years ago, and Devin Millard was sentenced to jail what, a couple months ago. Yeah. So a man went missing, a man was murdered, two killers were on the run. They've been found, they've been tried, and they've all been determined guilty yeah. in less than three years. 
Yeah, it's it's again. It goes to show that I I honestly believe that there's a different there's a different justice system right. for for indigenous people and indigenous victims than there are for non indigenous people and non indigenous victims. This this is a case of an indigenous man accused of killing another indigenous man. So finally, after four years, it creeps its way to the front page. Which yeah. credit, by the way, credit where credits due. Scott Gilmore's article yeah. in McLean's magazine is fantastic, right. and he did a great job writing that article. The coverage that CBC has dedicated to this, and you can. Look back on CBC's history. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness that we that there is a national broadcaster. The yeah. Canadians see having a national broadcaster as a priority to get this stuff that is sort of page twelve news. Thank yeah. goodness that that there is some kind of coverage on this. But what the ultimate end result of the story is is that this is yet another Canadian institution acting in the way that Canadian institutions have always acted with mm-hmm. Indigenous people. Whether whether it's the correctional institution, whether it's the child welfare institution whether it's the residential school system right institutions have never been friends to indigenous people and i have to ask myself are they are they ever going to be yeah exactly i mean one of the end results that uh, that the prosecutor or not the prosecution the defense is looking at is getting his charges stayed right like how is that justice how is him potentially getting off for a, make, uh, allegedly committing a crime how is that justice to the family? If his charges are stayed, what does that mean? Well, the at this point, though, I have to ask: hasn't hasn't he hasn't he suffered enough for for people? I mean, for people that are out there, I I would ask anybody who's listening yeah. just to just to imagine, just to imagine for a second the just the the thought of of silence, mm-hmm. the thought of isolation, the humming of what? the fluorescent light constantly. It, the, but to look at it from the victim's perspective, I mean, has he suffered enough? From the victim's perspective, did they even realize that he was locked up in segregation? So while I agree that he has suffered enough, if this was my son who was murdered and his killer was in jail and I haven't heard from him in four years, to me, you kill my son and you serve four years in jail, that's not serving enough time. Now, that being said, I'm not privy to the information of him being tortured for four years. So this is, as tragic as it is, this is a failure when it comes down to it, to the justice system. I mean, has he suffered enough? Yes, he has. But from the perspective of the victims, 10 years for killing a person, is that suffering? I don't Th- know. That's what I, that's what I have to ask myself. And, yeah. and when, it comes to, when it comes to Canadian institutions all the time, I don't know if I have any, any real faith in, I mean, I think it's legitimate to ask serious questions about the policing system. Right. I think it's legitimate to ask serious questions about the court system. And I think it's legitimate to ask serious questions about the corrections system. So if if something had happened to, uh, heaven forbid, if something had happened to, to somebody in my family, yeah. I don't know that I want the Canadian sus- justice system dealing with it because I don't, know, I don't know on what level it's actually working for the greater good. All you ever hear about are cost overruns and financial mm-hmm. matters and yep. money-related issues and not having the resources and police don't have the proper resources corrections officers don't have the yeah. proper resources proper there, aren't, there aren't enough people people aren't properly trained yeah. right so again is it, is it a priority to have justice in canada or not um yeah no no i mean is it where is the money being allocated properly and if the money is being allocated properly is the money being used properly is is it money that's the issue well there's not enough money right that's always the argument but is that the issue though (laughs) i mean like when it comes down to it are we just not adequately addressing the problem right restorative justice is one of the fundamental beliefs of of indigenous people and how we how we govern our own right um what do you know about restorative justice what do I know about it? Well, for me, restorative justice, what it comes down to is is the accused addressing the victim and everybody impacted and them dealing with it amongst themselves, um, but at a community level. Now, again, feel free to step in and correct me if, if I'm misquoting. Um, but uh, but essentially, though, is that you have to see here, like if I commit a crime, if I steal your sweater, it would be my obligation to come to you and have you speak your mind to me, have you let me know um, how I've wronged you, 
Yeah, my my understanding, if you if you commit an, an offense against me, yeah, the way the Canadian justice system works right now is that it punishes you, right? Like yeah. the cops will pick you up, and maybe you lose your job, and you get put inside, and maybe you have to pay some money. Yeah, maybe you have to have to be again punished a little bit. The idea of the restorative justice system is that if you wrong me, you fix it. Yeah, you figure out how to fix it. You've done something. If you if you've taken someone from my family, yeah, you better figure out a way to make amends for that. If you've yeah. taken if you've taken something that that I value mm-hmm. that's important to me then then you better figure out how to how to restore that to me that's that's a fundamental difference from from the system so again looking looking at the canadian justice system and uh, but then looking at the great wealth of history that canada has to draw from the restorative indigenous justice system that that existed and i believe worked for centuries upon centuries before there were non-indigenous people that that were here i, th- I think that's a better model i don't i don't want to know that i mean it might make me feel a little better when something bad happens to to some Somebody that is your enemy mm-hmm. or that has upset you in some way. I mean, in some ways that makes you feel better. But if you if you have a sense of loss, then I think the onus is on the person that caused that loss to restore the thing that was taken from you. That's that's the fundamental tenet of the restorative justice system. And, and that's something that, that I know that friends of ours are working on bringing to Niagara right now. They're looking right. at restorative justice measures because, again, at the end of the day, if you decide that you're not going to use capital punishment on people, then you're looking at a way to bring them back into society. I mean, ideally you should be. Are we, though? I mean, I don't think we are. I think um, life in prison is still a thing, right? If we're not using capital punishment, they are still serving 25 years in jail. I think I think what needs to happen is just a reevaluation of our current system. Top down. Yeah, exactly. Top down. Yeah, look at everything. I mean, even, though, even something as simple as a pilot project where we could, like you said, we're bringing restorative justice to Niagara, right? We have the Three Fires program that's operated out of the three major friendship centers here. Um, I have Fort Erie. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Is hiring a restorative justice worker. Yep. Uh, John yep. Howard Society has a re- restorative justice program that they are offering. I believe. Yep. Um, yeah, they're wor- they're working on it. So that. It, but but th- the thing is, though, is these are community driven organizations. These are not for profit organizations. And as well intentioned as they are, this is something that the the government should be spearheading. This is something that the province of Ontario should be spearheading. Um, I mean, in my in my eyes, and in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't know that I want to tell the government what to do. No, I, I have no problem. I do your I job. Haven't, I haven't seen any level again where where the government has shown actual leadership in this. They, the whole the whole justice system has been built on trying to improve upon past best practices, mm-hmm. right? And I think I think that the the fundamental way in which Canada founded right. was founded was on principles of of injustice, systemic racism, and and a failed and flawed system. So it's it's interesting because you you always have this question about whether whether you want to blow the pie up or whether you want to divide it in totally different ways. Right. right. I mean, I, I heard this again in, in Ruth and Laura's episode where they were talking about how revolutionaries, they just want to blow it up and, mm-hmm. and start over, burn down the palace, right? right? And build a new palace. Or do you want to reorder the palace? I wonder if justice is one of those instances where, where I think, I think maybe you could throw out a lot of the books on how things have been done. We definitely need to. I mean, it's been a bandaid approach since inception. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, this is broken. All right. Well, we'll hire more guards. We'll throw some more money here. And then come the next uh, next budget, what they do is they reallocate the funds and they fix the problem over there, realizing that they didn't actually fix that problem. They just put a Band-Aid over it, and once you remove that Band-Aid, that spot's still bleeding. There's still that gap. There's still that lack of service. There's still that lack of financial commitment. There's still meaningful justice in, in Ontario. Yeah, there. well, th- this is – there. there may be – I'm always a big proponent of if the better idea is out there instead of instead of trying to come up with a new idea mm-hmm. to copy that idea, right? So th- this is where I would put it out. If there if there are any listeners or yeah. anybody who's following us on Facebook, or if if you follow us on on Twitter uh, at at Sean Vanderclist or at Carl Doxater or at One Dish One Mike, I I would encourage people to if there are models that are working, things like the restorative justice model, things like the Three Fires Justice model. If there's something out there in your community that's working, I think I think we have a response responsibility to share those models i think i think that we should we should find something that works better because because i don't there, there's very little that you could say that would cause me to have faith in yet another right. canadian institution failing indigenous people
It means wrap it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, what? When, when you do that. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you have a traveling thought for the day? Um, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Do you want to share your traveling thought? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought we were going to get back into it. <laughs> like, I thought we were going to, yeah. I mean, what for... <laughs> Oh, wait a second. Sorry. Sorry. Wolves <laughs> well, have been. Do you want to roll podcasts. down the river? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want it? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were like reinvent the wheel. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> right. We gotta <laughs> just bring it all. <laughs> um. Do you, do you have a traveling thought? I mean, for me, I mean, it, it sounds like we're talking about revolutionary ideas when it comes down to it, but it, it's not. This is democracy at its finest. Um, we reside within a country, and it is our obligation, whether or not you believe in democracy and whether or not you think indigenous people should participate, it's our obligation to create change. Um, as, as citizens, as residents, as, as cohabitants of this, of this land, we, we need to do something profound because essentially our people are suffering, Canadian people are suffering, and the justice system's failing. For the last 150 years, it hasn't gotten it right. So we need to do something. So again, to anybody who's listening, to all of our subscribers, if you have any ideas, if you know of anything, let us know. Right? It's, the point of this podcast is to create a healthy dialogue. And I think with this issue at hand, it, it's, now's our chance. Anything you want to say? Yeah, my, my traveling thought for the day is simple. I think that the justice system failed Adam Cape. I think that it's incomprehensible for me to imagine being in a room where the lights are always on all day, 24-7. No comprehension of day, of night, not hearing another person's voice, not seeing other people, not seeing the outside, not being able to read a book, not being able to experience any of that. For me, it's evidence that the justice system as it stands right now is, if it's not completely useless, it's deeply flawed and it needs a fundamental rewrite. But I think that we have the minds to do it. I think that we have educated Indigenous people. I think that we have educated non-Indigenous people. I think that we need to take the justice system away from the penny pinchers and from the purse holders. We need to take it away from the politicians. We need to take it away from the bureaucrats. And we need to hand it over to the academics. We need to hand it over to the participants. We need to hand it over to the families of people that are affected by people that, that need to see some sort of action from the justice system. At the end of the day, I think that the fundamental way to fix the justice system is to pass that power back over to the Kinchogwa, over to the people, and to let the people fix something that definitely failed Adam Cape and is in a position to fail many more people. Well, thank you for that. Um, again, this is Sean Vanderclus and Carl Doxeter at the, the Niagara Podcast Studios. Uh, you listen to our episode, One Dish, One Mic. Follow us on Facebook. Like us on Twitter. Share our Facebook page. <laughs> Retweet us on Facebook. And like us. <laughs> this, and is like kind our of a, this is kind of a glum, uh, glum episode. I'm not feeling too excited. <laughs> <laughs> but like, share, love, hit that reaction button. And uh, until next time, guys. Thanks for listening. Miigwech. Yeah, man. Thanks for listening to One Dish, One Mic on the Niagara Podcasters Network. Your hosts are Carl Dockstader and Sean Vanderplus. Recording is done at the Pop-Up Podcast Studio at Cowork Niagara, home of Niagara's independent workforce. Executive producer is Trevor Twining. Production assistance by Daniel Twining. Show artwork by Mitch Baird. Music by DJ Shub, used with permission. If you have show ideas or comments, you can reach us on Twitter at Niagara Podcasts.